Good morning, church family. What a blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord one more time. It's a beautiful day out. And let me just say this. God answer prayers. God, um, if you don't believe that, just turn on the news and see who our new president is. A lot of prayer went into that, believe me. A lot of prayer. So I know prayer changes things. Prayer changes people too. So if you wouldn't mind, please just uh, join the deacons in the devotional services. Beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning. We'll start off with singing hymn 411. Lift them up. So please join in with me. How to reach the masses, men of every birth. For an answer, Jesus gave the key. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw men up to me. Lift him up, lift him up, still he speaks from eternity. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. Oh, the world is hungry. For the living bread, lift the Savior up for them to see. Trust him and do not doubt the words that he say. I'll draw all men unto me. Lift him up, lift him up. Still he speaks from eternity. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. Don't exhort the preacher, don't exhort the pew. Preach the gospel, simple, full, and free. Prove him, and you will find the promise. Is it true? I'll draw all men unto me. Lift him up, lift him up. Still he speaks from eternity. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. Lift him up, living as a Christian or let the world in you the Savior see. Then men will gladly follow him who was one to draw or men unto me. Lift him up, lift him up. Till he speaks from eternity. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. Lift him up, lift him up. Till he speaks from eternity. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. Amen, amen. 
Let us pray. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we come to you today with thanksgiving on our hearts. We come to you saying thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for waking us up this morning, starting us on our way. Thank you, Father, for the sun that's shining so bright today. Thank you, Lord, Father, for each and every day that you have given to us. Lord, we know that you didn't have to do it, but you did it anyway. And for that, we say thank you. We thank you, Father, for this church and each and every member of this church. Those that's here, those that want to be here and just could not for some reason, we say thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you for all that you have done. We say thank you for the preacher. Bless him. Touch his heart, Father. Bless his family. Bless each and every member of his family as he bring the word today. Lord, Father, if it had not been for you, I don't know where I would be. Lord, Father, I may not be 100% healthy, but I thank you for me being here. I thank you for your grace and your mercies. Lord, Father, I know it's a lot of things that I do not deserve, but because of who you are, you still keep me, Lord, Father. Lord, Father, even though I'm going through a time of bereavement, I still lift up your name and say thank you. Thank you for keeping my family. I lift up the Gatewood family, the Artist family, the Whitfield family as we go through this time, Lord, Father. Give us all, each, each and every one of us, the strength to keep moving on. And we know, we know that you will because of who you are. Thank you for this day that you have made for us. We will rejoice and be glad in it. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to go to him 248. Hold to God's unchanging hand. That's all we really can do. That's all we really need to do. Just keep holding on. Time is filled with swift transition. Not on earth our move can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to his hands. God's unchanging hands. Hold to his hands. God's unchanging hands. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Trust in him who will not leave you. Trust whatever years may bring.
from God and I really don't know what it means to be honest with you the only thing I remember him telling me Mark 13 I don't know why I don't know where it came from only thing I remember he said Mark 13 he didn't tell me what verse why he just said Mark 13 so that's what I'm going to be reading today Mark 13 beginning at the first verse. And it reads, And as he went out on the temple, when the disciples said unto him, Master, see what manners of stone and what buildings are here. And Jesus answering said unto him, See thou the great building, there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be signs when all these things shall be fulfilled. And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed, lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And when ye shall hear of the wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled, for such things must need be. By the end shall not be yet. For nation shall rise against nations, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be earthquakes, and divers place, and there shall be famines and troubles. But these are the beginnings of sorrow. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to counsel. And in the synagogue ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for testimony against them. And the gospel must be first be published amongst all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no, though do beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in the hour that speak ye for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. I have read Mark 13, 1 through 12. Amen to the reading of the word.
Jesus, blessed Savior, he's worthy to, to be praised. Come on, everybody, let's sing. Praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him. Jesus, blessed Savior, he's worthy to be praised from the rising, from the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He's worthy, he's worthy to be praised, lift your voice, praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him, Jesus, blessed, hallelujah, Savior. He's worthy to be praised. Listen. God is my rock unto salvation. A strong, strong deliverer. In him I will always trust. Come on, praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Jesus, blessed Savior. He's worthy. He's so worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Hallelujah, he's worthy to be praised. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Yes. Good morning, family. Good morning. Praise God, praise God, praise God for this day. Hallelujah. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And we can praise him. Can't we praise him today? Did we have some good news this week? From the rising of the sun and the going down of the same. Hallelujah. He's worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. May we all stand for our call to worship. Recite our 100th song. Let's begin. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. So Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that have made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates, thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endure to all generations. We'll now recite our mission and vision statement. Let's begin. And to all people, Jesus Christ, 
that are empowering ministries by equipping the membership through the effective teaching and preaching of the word to the glory of God. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the precious name of your Son, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we come today with grateful hearts, grateful, O oh God, that you allowed us to be here one more day. We don't know what the next hour will bring, but we know at this moment we are here to say thank you that you allowed us to get up this morning, that you were on our mind when we got up, that we pressed our way. Because we know, oh God, when we press our way, then we receive your blessings. So we thank you, God, for a peaceful and a restful night. And we lift up those, oh God, who did not have a peaceful and a restful night. Thank you, God, for bringing us through this past week. From last Sunday to this. We thank you, God, that we have much to celebrate for. The 15th Amendment, oh God. 150 years old that allowed black men the right to vote. And then the 19th Amendment, oh God, that was ratified 100 years ago that gave the women the power to vote. Glory to God. For women, oh God, thank you, Lord, played a significant role, hallelujah, this past week when we voted. So we give you all glory, honor, and praise, hallelujah, for all that you blessed us with this past week. We thank you for our health and our strength. We thank you, God, that we know who we are, that we could stand on our own two feet. But we realize, oh God, that there are so many that cannot stand on their own two feet, and we do not want to take that for granted. So we thank you for our service today, oh God, for we came to fellowship and worship you, giving you all glory, honor, and the praise that you so deserve. We thank you for every congregant that's here today. Those that are listening and seeing us on live stream, we thank you for them. For wherever we are, that's where you are. So we give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise, oh God. We thank you for our musicians today. We thank you for our drummer today. We thank you for those that are manning the door, our ushers. We thank you for our deacons. We thank you for our deaconess. We thank you, God, for every unit in this church. We thank you, God, for we know the church is in us. So we thank you for the building that we have that we can come and fellowship and worship in the name of Jesus. So we give this service over to you. We surrender, oh God, that your spirit reigns in this place today. From every heart and heart, from every breast to breast, and from pew to pew, from the pulpit to the door, in the name of Jesus. And we count it done and rebuke any demonic force that tries to disrupt we rebuke it, we bind it up in the name of Jesus. For it has no rights, no place, and no authority. So in Jesus' name, we thank you, God. And we all say, amen. Amen. We'll now have our morning hymn. Hymn number 493. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Everybody, 
Well, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Yes, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I promise him that I I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I was alone. I was alone. Well, battlefield for my Lord. Yes, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I promise him that I on the battlefield for my Lord. The battlefield for my Lord. Uh huh. Left. Battlefield for my Lord. Yes, I'm on battlefield for my Lord. Well, I promise him that I will serve him till I die. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. for the Lord, on the battlefield. You know, he woke you up this morning. You didn't wake yourself up. He started you on your way. He got you here safely. He has blessed you and kept you. He has blessed us as a people and kept us. You know, I turned on the TV last night, and they had a program on about the African-American soldiers in World War II. And I learned so much about their contribution. Many of us know about the Tuskegee Airmen, but there were so many other soldiers, and they had to wait sometimes close to 50 years to get their medals, to be honored, to be recognized for their bravery. We have a proud and a long history. Make sure you share it with your children. And some of you are rejoicing because you like the results of the election, and that's all good. But we have a responsibility to pray for our leaders. Whether we voted for them or we didn't vote for them, we need to pray for them, to have God have their hands on them and to direct them and to keep them and to ask God to keep his angels around our new leaders. So keep that in mind. If you're on the battlefield, you're not just praying for you and your family. You are required, God expects you to pray for the leaders of our country. I praise the Lord today. I'm thankful. I stand here by his grace and through his power, and so do you. God has kept you, blessed you, watched over you. It's a rejoicing time. I thank the Lord. Now I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to do the announcements. Okay? Praise God. But I, you know you can't stand here and not praise God. You can't come to church and not look up and say, thank you, Lord. You can't get up and say, you know, it's another day's journey. There's somebody who didn't make the journey. As the as folks would say, they're on the cooling board. Not that I ever saw a cooling board, but you all taught me about the cooling board. So there's some folks that's on the cooling board. They're not here, but we're here. And while we're here, we want to praise God. We want to thank God. We want to rejoice in the Lord. 
The announcements I have, the homegoing for Sister Eartha Lewis will take place at Rose's Funeral Home on Thursday. Viewing is from 10 a.m. to 12, and the service begins at 12. The homegoing for our deaconess Pauline Smith will be here at First Baptist tomorrow. And the, the viewing will be from 11 to 12. The service will be at 12 o'clock. At this time, Deacon Jones has announcements for us. Good morning, church. Good morning. I'd like to first uh, of all make a correction to a statement I made last week. I said to you that I woke up, uh, the Lord woke me up, and I jumped out of bed. <laughs> now, y'all heard that. And uh, my pastor reminded me that you just don't jump out of bed after a certain age. Uh, I was so glad to be up that I just thought I had jumped up. <laughs> but I didn't. I rolled over to the edge and... Uh, then I kind of stepped off and I got up. But I was just glad to be able to stand up. Yes. And same thing today. It's such a beautiful day out there. And we've been having some beautiful weather. And it just makes you feel alive. And I'm just glad to be in First Baptist once again this morning. And I've come to remind you uh, that I made an announcement about the month of October. And that is the Pastor's Appreciation Month. Now, I know October is going by, but we want to appreciate him, not just the month of October, but during the year of 2020. And so we, that's why we've come. We've taken that time because that's on the national calendar. But we want to appreciate our pastor, Pastor Darius Dixon Brown, all, um, Darius Dixon Clark, all year long. And so we're going to ask that you do the same thing. We want you to let him know that. Let him know that we ask that you would go out and maybe pick up a little envelope, or pick up, you know, a card. And uh, if you can, put something in there to let him know, Pastor, we appreciate you for all that you do, all that you've done. And he's done quite a few things in the background that you don't even think about. But let him know, Pastor, yeah, we're, we're glad you're here. We're glad for you. And so we, we, we just want to let you know that. We're going to have two deacons up front holding a basket, and we're going to ask if you bought your cards or whatever, that you would drop them in that basket, that he might receive them today. I don't see any trustees right now, but if they are in the building that can hear my voice, would you please provide us with a couple of baskets that will allow us to be so. So remember, this is Pastor's, anniversary, Pastor's Appreciation Year. We want to appreciate him all year long. But right now, we're just going to do this right now to let Pastor know, thank you. Thank you that you've been obedient. You've come, you preach, you teach, and we're just so thankful for you. God bless you. God bless. Amen. We will have our altar prayer now by Elder Bruce Edmonds. We praise our God this morning. We are so thankful that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. We can come to the altar, but there's some among us that can't. So we want to stand in the gap for them. Let us pray. Our Father, in the precious name of Jesus, Lord, we realize, we recognize somebody prayed for us when we were not praying 
Father, we know that the pastor was praying for us as part of the congregation. And through BTU and Sunday school, we realized that Jesus prayed for us. So we're standing in the gap for our loved ones, for those who cannot make it to the house of prayer, those who can't even get on their knees this morning. So we come boldly to the throne of grace for them. And we lift up the loved ones amongst us that are hurting this morning. We lift up our Deacon Gateword because his grandmother has passed. So we lift his family up. Lord, we lift up Sister Newsom's family for her brother had passed. So we lift up the Newsom family. We lift up our dear sister Annie Bennett who had had a fall and has broken her back. Lord, if she could, she would get on her knees. So we lift her up to you, Lord God. And our sister Leslie's in the hospital. Lord God, we lift her and her family up, Lord God. We lift up our sisters and brothers that we used to see before the pandemic, Lord God. We used to sing songs of Zion as we sat next to them. We have not seen them in so many months, so we lift them up to you, Father God. We lift up, Lord God, all who are on a sick, shut-in, and recovering list of this congregation. We lift up all of our emeritus members, Lord God. And Lord, especially, we lift up this country this morning because there's a question that's coming across everyone's mind. Now what? Oh, Father, we pray that with the results of everything that's been happening lately, we pray for a revival to break out in this nation, Lord God. We pray for the zeal of the people to stand up and say, for God we live and for God we die. Let us see what our leaders are going to do as we lift them up in prayer, Lord God. And there's some among us, Lord God, that are standing in the need of prayer. So we lift them up to you, Father God, we pray. Have your way with them. And thank you for doing so. For we know, Lord God, you hear our every prayer. Our heart's earnest request for our loved ones. Lord, thank you. Because when we pray to you, Lord, we touch your heart and you move your hand. So, Lord, move amongst us, we pray. Move amongst this nation of ours, we pray. Lord, move across this great world, we pray. Because we know the time is short. There's going to be a day, hallelujah, when the sky is going to crack. There's going to be a day when the saints are called home. Hallelujah. Lord, we just lift up those who don't know you at this time. All of this we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That the Lord has kept me. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Just another day that the Lord has kept me. He has kept me from all evil with my mind stayed on Jesus. Just another day that the Lord has kept me. I'm so glad that the Lord has kept me. I'm so glad that the Lord has kept me. He has kept me from all evil. With my mind stayed on Jesus. Just another day that the Lord ah, has kept me.
This morning is coming from the book of James, chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. I'll give you a moment to find it, the book of James, chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. It's on your monitors also. And it reads, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Amen. Amen. Amen, saints. God bless y'all. How y'all doing? Y'all should be really happy. I mean, look, we didn't even run. <laughs> uh -huh. that, make, that makes me realize that some things that my grandmother and my, my mother and my father used to sing, uh, I want to share this with you. There are some things I may not know There are some places That I can't go But I am sure Of this one thing That God is real for I can feel him deep within. Listen, I cannot fail. How you felt when Jesus took your sins away. But I'm that hour. God has been real For I can feel His holy power His holy power Oh, yes, God is real He's real in my soul Yes, God is real For He has washed and made me whole His love for me Oh, is like a pure gold Yes, God is real Come on, help me sing it Him in my soul Yes, yes, God is real in my soul yes God is real for he can wash and make me whole his love for me is like pure gold yes God is real for I can feel Live in my soul. I got to play it.
your sky is real He's real in my soul Yes, God is real For he has washed And made me whole His love for me Is like pure gold Yes, God is real For I can feel Him Hallelujah Him in my soul I don't know. <laughs> yes. 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 Hallelujah. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Come on in here this morning. Is there anyone that believes that God is real oh come on don't fool me now do you believe do you know that God is real yes yes my grandma used to say I wouldn't serve a God that I couldn't feel sometimes hello somebody we have some good times some bad times some times that we're up and times that we're bad but another songwriter said through it all yeah through all that we've been through, I've learned to trust in God. I've learned to depend on God. God is real, y'all. Yes, he is. I saw a billboard the other day, and the billboard said, if you don't believe that there is a God, look in the mirror. So Jones almost ran off the road. <laughs> You're here because there is a God. And David said it this way, let everything yes, yes. that have breath, Hallelujah, yeah. praise, come on, come on, come on, let everything, if you've got breath in your body, let everything that have breath, do what? Praise ye the Lord. Our God is worthy of all of our praise, all of our honor, and all of our worship. Come on, let's give God a hand clap of praise. For Brother Anthony, thank you so much God bless you. for leading us into the place of worship. It's worship time. Not time to fold clothes, wash dishes. It's worship time. Not time to get on the phone and gossip. It's worship time. It's time that we set aside to hear from the Lord. Amen. The big mama would be doing stuff and she'd just go to humming. It was her worship time. She'd pull herself aside and she would say, y'all children, go somewhere and sit down now. I'm talking to the Lord. Hello, somebody. We have a reason, we have a right, and we have a responsibility to praise the Lord. That no matter what's going on in this nation, we have a right, a reason, and a responsibility to praise the Lord. If you read your Bible like I read my Bible, governments come and go. Amen, somebody. You've been following the Sunday school lessons over this, this time of pandemic. We're talking about the children of Israel and all of the kings that they got. And some of them were good. Some of them were bad. And the bad ones, they learned from them. Amen, somebody. And the truth of the matter is, I was telling somebody early this morning, listen, we ask for things because we don't have a broad perspective. We have a narrow perspective, and we ask for things. 
And sometimes, sometimes, Elder Bruce, we get just what we ask for. And when we get it, we hate it that we ask for it. Hello, somebody. But we've got to learn from what we've gone through and what we've experienced. And the bottom line, we've got to trust in the God that we serve. Amen, somebody. I told Xavier uh, a while ago, Elder Goodwin, I said, you've got to understand, I've learned this about God. God always balances the books. Somebody know what I'm talking about. You might get shorted in life over on this way. You just keep on living. God will make it up somewhere else. Because God can see far beyond what we can see. We've got to trust in God. Come on, can we just give God a hand clap of praise? Hallelujah. Listen, I am, I will public state, I like the way the election went. Amen. Just took time for it to happen. Amen. But ultimately, we should not put our trust in any man. Because they're all human. Hello, somebody. And if you understand politics and the political structure in these United States of America, the president is just a figurehead. It's the Congress that makes the laws. And we need to pray for them. Amen, somebody. Because you can be the president and have a Congress that's against you, and Obama will tell you, you won't get nothing done. Hello, somebody. But it's good to have somebody coming in office that at least on the surface. I can't get underneath it, but at least on the surface, he appears to be a president for all of the people. And that's what's important. Amen? Amen. So we continue to be patient. We continue to pray. We continue to put our trust in God. Amen? That's my political rant this morning. Thank all of you for going out and voting. Amen. Amen. For the first time in U.S. history, every vote is being counted. Amen. And your vote counts. Amen. I want to continue the sermon that I, I started last week. Um, and there was uh, much discussion, very positive discussion that, that I have received um, since last Sunday. And I thank those of you uh, who do that. I, I want you to understand I don't live in a vacuum. Uh, and I don't think all of my views and all of my ways and all of my actions are the only way, are the only actions, are the only thoughts. Amen. I just look to God and ask God to direct me through his word so that I can bring a word that will help you and challenge you in your growth continuum. Amen. You got to understand that you can't grow without some pain. I don't know if anybody, any of you have seen Johnny lately. Johnny is, is growing up like a beanstalk. And he's growing so fast that his legs are hurting because those bones are being stretched out and he's limping around the house like an old man. <laughs> but it's growing pains. And as we grow in our relationship with God, we're going to be stretched. And I don't care how long you've been in the church or how long you've been walking with the Lord, you still don't know all that it is to know about God. Come on, somebody. You don't know all there is to know about the Bible. You don't know all that there is to know about religion. And so you ought to want to be in a place where I want to know more. I want to know more. And then what I don't understand after I read and study, I'm depending, a Minister Cornigan's, on the Holy Spirit to lead me and to lead and guide us into all truths. And so last week I, I introduced a, a sermon that I, I think I'm going to spend a few weeks on called The Difference Maker, The Difference Maker. And today I want to do part two of that, and I want to talk about the gap between faith and action. The gap between faith and action. The scripture that was read in your hearing from uh, Paul's epistle to James Apostle James, uh, chapter number 2, um, and I think verses 14 uh, to 17 was read. Uh, but I want to read it again, uh, because I really want you to hear what's being said. 
What use is it, my brethren, if someone says they have faith but have no works? Can that faith save them? And one of you say to them, go in peace and be warm and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their bodies, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. God, we thank you. God, we bless you for this moment in time that has been orchestrated and directed and carved out by your hand and by your mind. We thank you, Lord God, that you have orchestrated the events of my physical being and calling that allows me to stand behind this sacred desk to speak to these, your people. I pray even now, Lord God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will truly be acceptable in your sight and pleasing, that it would challenge every man, woman, boy, and girl that is listening and tuned into this service, this worship, that they would hear your voice, and they would be challenged in their walk of faith. We ask these in all blessings in your son, even our savior, Jesus' name we pray, and all the people of God say it. Amen. Where does faith come from? We know what the Bible says. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Where does belief come from? Hmm. One would say, well, pastor, isn't it the same? Well, the word believe is a verb in most of case of usage, and it is considered, or it is to consider to be truth or honest, is what you believe. The difference between belief and faith is that belief is based on evidence. Mm -hmm. Belief is based on rational and cognitive thought. Belief is based on proof. We believe something because we have been presented with proof. When I was a child, I used to get in trouble all the time because my daddy would say something and my response to him would be, why? In other words, I was asking Deacon Cornigan for some proof. And then when I asked him why, his response, that was the proof because I said so. And at that moment as a child, depending on my father for all of my provisions, I had to take because I said so as truth and believe it. But as I got older, I understood my daddy didn't know everything. But at the time, he knew all I needed to know. Hello, somebody. And in my developmental years, and he was forming uh, my moral standards and my way of life, I had to trust <coughs> and believe that what he was saying to me was truth. But at the same time, when I look at it in retrospect, there were some inconsistencies in what my daddy said and what my daddy did. Oh, y'all ain't got to say amen. I'm just, I'm just saying what I'm saying. My, my daddy would tell me not to lie. But yet when the bill collector called, he would tell me to tell them he wasn't home. There were inconsistencies in what he said and what he did. So when I talk about belief, belief is based on evidence, but then when I gravitate as a spiritual being to this place called faith, then I reach and get what the scripture says in Hebrews about faith, and it says, now faith is the essence or the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. Now, if I take the biblical definition of 
faith and I just position it against belief, I got a problem. Because belief said, I work on evidence. Faith says, if I don't see it, I still believe it. Belief says, this is wood, and I can put my hand on it. Faith said, God is here. But I can't put my fingers on him. I can't touch him. I can't see him. But faith says, even though I don't see it, it's here. Come on, come on, somebody. We, we have faith in a savior named Jesus, who is the Christ. We have faith that he suffered, bled, and died, that he lived, suffered, bled, and died, that he was born, he lived, he suffered, he bled, he died, he was buried, and on the third day, God raised him up from the dead. We believe that. And we believe that because somebody told us. None of us were eyewitnesses to the life. Birth, the life, and the death of Jesus Christ. We were not eyewitnesses. Matter of fact, if we went to testify on behalf of Jesus in a court of law, our testimony would be declared invalid because it would be hearsay. It would be hearsay because we did not see it for ourselves and we would have to preface our statement by saying, somebody told me. I use the word somebody or somebody told you because depending on what version of the Bible you read, somebody. <laughs> Somebody told you, whether it was King James Version or the New English American Standard Version or the New Jerusalem Bible, I could go on down the list, the NIV. So, somebody told you, or maybe it was Big Mama that told you. Big Mama said Jesus suffered, bled, and died. He was buried and he rose again. And we believed it because Big Mama said it. We didn't question it because when Big Mama said it, she had some passion behind it. Hello, somebody. And when Big Mama prayed, she prayed like she was talking to God who was sitting in the room with her. And we could see Big Mama's faith. I, I remember one time as a child, we were all sitting around the floor and Grandma said, go in and set the table, kids. And all of us knew there wasn't no food in the kitchen. But Grandma said, go set the table. And when it was dinner time, we all looking at each other. Grandma had already prayed. There was a knock at the door. I wish I had some help in here. Grandma knew that God was going to provide. So as we look at this thing of faith and belief and we just position them against each other, they both have a corresponding reaction. And the corresponding reaction is if you believe something, you're going to act on what you believe. If you believe the sun's going to shine, you're going to leave your umbrella at home. But if you believe it's going to rain, you're going to prepare yourself. Hello, somebody. But faith says even though it doesn't look like what you think it's going to be, if you have faith to believe, your faith can will it into existence. I think it was Norman Vincent Peale who wrote a book uh, not too long ago called The Power of Positive Thinking. Some of you have seen that book. Some of you have read that book. Some of you have gone through the tenets of it, and you, you've tried to implement some of those things. Well, you know, if I, could, if I could just think it to be so, it would be so. Well, you know what? If you look at this red carpet long enough and tell you it's blue, your mind will begin to change the color of the rug. I said, if you do it long enough. Hello, somebody. Just do it long enough. I, I know it's been read for over 30 years, but if you do it long enough, because your mind is a tool that can be manipulated. Oh, I wish I had some help in here. That's why faith is not up here. Faith is not generated. Faith is not given birth in your head. 
Faith lives in your heart, in your being. Watch this. If thou wilt confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Now, I can get very psychological and very deep this morning to deal with this whole idea of belief in the head and the belief in the heart and the psychological impact and all of the tenets that lead us to the place of belief. But the ultimate thing that we need to understand is faith is not rational. And when I use the word rational, I'm talking about faith does not deal with the same things that truth or belief does. Because belief deals with evidence. All right? So I have faith in something that I have not seen, but because I have faith in it, and I orchestrate and govern my life around that, or because of that, guess what? It's going to begin to show up in my life. I wasn't there when Jesus suffered, bled, and died, but by faith, I can reap the benefits of his death, burial, and resurrection some 2,000 years later. Many of us went to the polls on Tuesday with faith that our candidate was going to win. And depending on which side of the field you lined up on, when the results start coming in, you were either happy or you were sad or you were patient. See, because here's what the Bible says. It doth not yet appear. That means life is a process. I got to go through some things. And sometimes along the road, it's going to look like I'm not getting where I'm going. But I have to have faith that I'm going to get there no matter what it looks like in my current situation. Ah. So the scripture here or the text here in James raises this issue about what I would discern as a gap between faith and action. And the question is raised if you say you have faith in your heart, you say you have faith, there ought to be, there should be some corresponding actions to what you believe. Each one of you, and I, I, I watched most of you come in today. You didn't know I was watching you, but I was watching you. You came in today, and you went to a pew, and you sat down. Nobody checked to see if the pew was going to hold you. Did anybody do it? Did anybody check the pew and shake it to make sure it was steady? Oh, you just plop right down. You're glad to sit down. You come up the steps, a nice warm day. Here you are. You just sat down. I did the same thing. I sat down in the seat, didn't think nothing about it. Why? Because you had previous experience with that pew. But not only did you have previous experience, when you walked in, there were some other people sitting in some other pews, and they seemed like they were okay. Come on, y'all. And because they seemed like they were okay, you did not have reason to check yours. But if you'd have walked in here and one of the pews was like this, you'd have walked up to your pew and looked at their pew and you would have checked it out. But because you are a spiritual being, you have faith to believe that that pew is going to hold you, that your, your seat is going to hold you. And so you just sit on down. And once you sit down, watch this, you get confirmation of what you believe before you sit down. Oh, y'all don't hear me in here. If, watch this. Here's what the scripture says. If you don't believe God is good, here's what the word says. Oh, taste. In other words, try it. If you believe God is good, then the life that you live ought to demonstrate that faith in a good God. Oh, y'all don't hear me in here. Let, let, let me pull some of the 4,300 uh, religious groups that I, I spoke to you last week about. I'm not going to talk about them. I'm just going to identify a couple of them. The Jews. 
the Jews, in the tenets of their faith, use as their foundation the Torah, the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. And they use it, not just the Ten Commandments, but all of the commandments of God. And they use that to interact with one another, to interact with their God, and hopefully be better people. Matter of fact, their goal was to fulfill all of the laws and be perfect in them. The problem was because they were in their human person or their human being, it was, and this is what the Bible says, impossible for them to keep all of the laws. And so what did they have to do? They had to keep going back over and over and over again, asking God to forgive them for the sins that they had committed because they believed if they, if they violated one, they violated all. In other words, it, it wasn't an a la carte situation. I couldn't pick and choose the ones that I wanted to abide by and then just let the other ones go by the wayside. When Jesus, who was born a Jew, raised a Jew, lived a Jew, when he was asked about the validity of the law of Moses by the Pharisees, they posed a question to him. They said, out of all of the laws and the prophets, which one was the most important? It was a trick question because they were really trying to get him to hang himself. And Jesus says, well, all the law and the prophets are, are really rooted and grounded in one. You should love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all your mind, and with all your spirit. And the second one is like the first one. You should love your neighbor as yourself. Watch this. Then he says, on these two, hang all the laws and the prophets. Because if you go back and you look at the 400 and some Levitical laws that were given, they had to do with our relationship with God and our relationship with each other. And so Jesus said, if you really want to buy, boil it down to not the letter, but the spirit of the law, it's really about loving God and loving one another. And if you love God, you're going to treat God a certain way. If you love God and you love yourself, then you're going to treat others. Likewise. So I'm going to love God and I'm going to treat God with respect and love and admiration. That's what I believe and that's what I also should demonstrate in the life that I live. And if I love God, I ought to love you because you are God's creations just like I am. And so to respect God, I got to respect you. Ooh, pastor getting in trouble today, but I'm going to preach anyway. So if I have faith in God, I, I govern myself a certain way. Here's what uh, James says. He says, you say you have faith, but you come across a person who is in destitute. They are in need of clothes, food, or something else. And you say to them, I prayed for you. Go on, be well. And how do they leave you? The same way they came. If you have faith that God is going to provide for you and God has blessed you and God says to you to help somebody else, your neighbor, your brother, and you do that, then they are better because your faith in God has now been demonstrated through your actions. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's scripture. Without faith in your heart, in God, it is impossible to please God. So here's what the devil does. Here's what the enemy does. Here's, here's what uh, the adversary tries to do. If the adversary understands that the root of your faith is the word of God, because you wasn't there, you've got to take somebody else's word for it, which is the word of God, which is the word that has been inspired by God and distributed by varying men over time and eternity. And it's been consistent because God breathed it. God inspired it. God led the hand that were writing it. You now have that by God. Are y'all with me? 
if you if I if I understand as the adversary that this is the basis for your faith, what am I going to try to do? I'm going to try to discredit this. I'm going to try to discount this because if I can discredit and discount this, then I can discredit and discount your faith. And, and are you hearing me? If I can tell you that, yeah, Jesus may have been born of a virgin, but I can also pull five other religions and tell you that their story begins the same way. That their God was born of a virgin. Hello, somebody. And I could go through the whole story where they talk about their prophet was a, a servant of God. But when we get to the end of the story, their prophet died. And is still dead. And their remains are still in the grave. But they can't find the remains of Jesus. Y'all read the story. They paid the guards money to discredit the resurrection story. It's in the book. They paid them to say, if anybody asks you, because you were there and we wasn't, tell them that while you were sleeping, guards that are supposed to be on guard, <laughs> while you were sleeping, his disciples came. Let me put a comma. If you're sleeping, how do you know who came? How would you know who came? But tell them that his disciples came while you were sleeping and took the body of Jesus away and buried it somewhere else so that we would know where it was. And why didn't y'all wake up when they rolled that big stone from in front of the tomb? Come on, there's, there's too many questions, but this is what the adversary would have you to believe or have you to be confronted with so that he can challenge what you believe. And so the moment somebody comes, and if you don't have a firm hold on what you believe in the word of God, you'll start bending with every wind of doctrine that comes. And you will try to analyze your faith with your head. And when you start analyzing your faith with your head, you're going to lose out right. every time. Right. Your faith in God has to be partnered with some actions. I need you to understand this. When Jesus comes and lives on the earth, John said it this way. In the beginning, John 14, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And then later on in the chapter he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In other words, the word which started out on a tablet, on a, on a piece of stone where God carved out the word, then it moved later on to, to parchment, to lambskin, and then moved on to some paper. Hello, somebody that in the New Testament becomes flesh and blood that is living and moving in the midst of us. And all of the things that we're confronted with that challenges our faith through our knowledge or through our head, Jesus endured. The Bible says he was tried at all points in Hebrews and did not sin. In other words, he did not succumb to the things that were confronted to him. Your faith is going to be tested. And by reason that is being tested is evident of the fact that you have faith and that there is a God. Hear these words as the commentator gives background about the book of James. Faith without works cannot be called faith. Faith without works is dead. And a dead faith is worse than no faith at all. Faith must work. It must produce. It must be visible. Verbal faith is not enough. Mental faith is insufficient. Faith must be there. 
Hello, but it must be more. It must be inspired action. Throughout this epistle, Jewish believers, to Jewish believers, James integrates true faith in everyday practical experience by stressing that true faith must manifest itself in the works of faith. True faith must have some work. If you say that you trust in God, if you say and you believe that God is going to provide, then don't go out here trying to make a deal with the devil to pay your bills. If you believe that God is going to provide a job for you, get up off of the couch and go look for the job. I wish I had some help in here. If God said he was going to supply your needs, he said he was going to supply at some point. You better go up and start looking for it. Hello, somebody. God is not in faith is not your magical button that you push. And like an ATM, after you put in the right code, some money's going to jump out. It does not work that way, beloved. It's not just saying it at some point. You've got to have your life line up with what you say you believe. In other words, at some point in your walk, you have to become your faith. I believe Jesus as Lord and Savior. I believe God is creator. I believe that the Holy Spirit dwells on the inside of me. But throughout your life, there has been no change in your life since the day you said you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Paul went down to the Corinthian church as it was a fledging church. It was beginning and Paul was on his missionary journey. He went down there and he asked them an interesting question. He said, have you Receive the Holy Ghost since you believe. Right? That's the question he asked. You know what their response was? We haven't even heard that there be a Holy Spirit. Now, the significance of that is this. If you haven't heard of it, you're not looking for it. And if you're not looking for it, it could come and pass you right on by. So if you believe that God is going to supply your needs, but you ain't looking for it to come, it could come and you miss it. I, I had ordered a package, and the package had taken so long to come. I didn't order it from Amazon. <laughs> I ordered it from one of them other companies. It took so long to come that I forgot that I placed the order. And I came home one day, and there was a box sitting on the porch. And I'm looking at the box. I said, well, the box ain't mine because I haven't ordered anything. And I looked down at the box, and it had my name on it. I said, well, it's got my name on it. So it must be for me. I must order. But what did I order? I mean, when I say it had been a long time, it was six months. And I opened up the box. I know some of you saying, well, you ordered for six months. Why, why didn't you check it out, track it, see what was going on? No, I did. And they told me it was delayed because it was coming from one of those countries. <laughs> you got to know where you're ordering from. You know where you're ordering from, you know it may take some time for it to get there. Well, I opened up the box and I pulled out the box and said, oh, I did order this. But the first couple of weeks after I ordered it, guess what I was doing? I was going to the door every day looking for it. I was going to the door every day looking for it. But after six months, I stopped looking for it. Hello, somebody. If you know God's going to bless you, come on, don't stop looking for it. I, I'm just about done. God, God said it like this, and Big Mama confirmed it. He, he may not come. When you want him to. But when he does. Show up. He's right. On time. If you say you believe in God. Don't stop looking. For your blessing. Because he said he's going to bless you. Matter of fact the, New the Old Testament says this way. Every day. There's new mercies. And new blessings. He's got coming my way. And God knows 
just what we need when we need it. Y'all don't hear me. If we go back and we talk about coronavirus and nobody was looking for coronavirus and everybody's talking about all the negative effects of coronavirus, I dare you to look for a moment at some of the positive things that has come out of coronavirus. I mean, the reality of it is it's made some of us stop and take inventory uh, of our own selves uh, and our own relationships uh, because the truth of the matter is there were some folk that were here yesterday that are gone on away uh, and it's only by the grace of God uh, that we're still here uh, Paul come on and help me uh, Paul said all things uh, work together uh, for the good uh, for them that love God uh, and are called uh, according to his purpose uh, he didn't say it was going to be good uh, he said it is working out uh, for our good uh, I dare you uh, to stand up and shout today. Uh, I dare you to declare uh, that I've got faith in God. Uh, that even when I can't see him, uh, I'm going to line up my life uh, with what I believe. Uh, sickness is going to come. Uh, trials are going to come. Uh, death's going to come. Uh, but it just didn't start today. Uh, sickness has always been around. Uh, trials has always been around. Uh, death has always been around. Uh, but I heard the songwriter say it like this. Uh, I've been young <laughs> and now I'm old. Uh, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken uh, nor a seed uh, begging bread. Uh, Big Mama put it like this. Uh, he's the same yesterday, uh, today uh, and forevermore. Uh, and I've got faith in my heart to believe that God is always going to be God regardless of who's in the White House I'm glad of who's in the right house and it's God my Savior God my keeper God my protector God my provider God my way out of no way God my wheel in the middle of a wheel. God, my rock in quicksand land. God, my shelter in the stormy blast. God, he is. He is. He is my all and all. Long Island Expressway, Long Island Railroad, and the Metro, the subway in the city, when you go to get on the train, there's a warning sign. And the warning sign says, watch the gap. Watch the gap. They, they're warning you that there's a gap between the platform and the train. I need you to watch the gap between your faith and your works. Because the scripture says, if you've got faith and no works, then your faith is dead. That means you done fail in the gap. You need to ask yourself, don't look at nobody else. You need to ask yourself the question, is there a gap in my faith and my works. Let's be real. All of us have a gap in our faith and our works. It's human nature. The question is, how wide is your gap? Because if the gap is so wide that you can't step over it, you've got a problem. If the gap is so wide that you can't distinguish between what you believe and what you do, you've got a problem. Closing the gap is doing everything that you can in your walk to line up with your talk. Don't say you love God whom you have not seen. 
can't stand your brother who you see every day. As we stand on our feet, the doors of the church is open today to challenge you. Don't just take what somebody says as truth. Do your research. Challenge yourself. At the end of the day, trust God. Whatever you want to call him, there's 4,300 religions in the, church, in the world, and they all call God by a different name. But they all believe that there is a supreme being. Hello, somebody. We're here because there's commonality in what we believe. Because we believe what Romans said. If we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus, the Son of God, suffered, bled, and died and was raised by God with all power in his hands, you shall be saved. That's what we choose to believe. Hello, somebody. Maybe when you were a child, it was forced upon you, but now you are an adult. You can analyze some things and make the choice for yourself. Hello, somebody. Don't just take what I say or any of these ministers say. Listen, if you don't like this book, go get another one. They got a whole lot of them out there that will say whatever you want to believe. But whatever you choose to believe, make sure that what you believe and what you do line up with each other. Hello, somebody. Hello. I, I'm just telling you. Let your faith and your works coincide with each other. Don't let them just be intersections. Let them be the same road moving in the same direction, in the same lanes. As I close today, someone raised the question. I thought it was an interesting question. I've raised it in past years. But the question was, as a Christian, if you were arrested for being a Christian and the prosecuting attorney had you arrested, brought you up on charges, the question that the prosecuting attorney would have to answer, is there enough evidence to convict you? Is it going to be a long drawn out trial with a whole lot of circumstantial evidence? Or is it going to be a slam dunk? Because there will be overwhelming evidence that your life lines up with your faith. Would you be found guilty? Or would you be acquitted beyond reasonable doubt? Because there was not enough evidence to convict you. Only you can answer that question. And I would rather for you to ponder that question and answer that question today than to have to stand before the judge of all creation and have God open up the book and the record will show whether you are or you're not. But today is the day. Today is the day to get your life together. Coming to Jesus is just step one. And if, if the reality Elder Bruce is told, that's the easiest step. It's living what you believe. In the midst of peer pressure, in the midst of family pressures, in the midst of economic pressures, in the midst of world pressures, your faith is going to be tested. But is your faith unmovable, unshakable? Here's what Paul says. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor or your work is not in vain in the Lord. You may not get no credit down here. You may not get a pat on your back. But one of these old mornings, when the great trump sounds, when this life is over, we will hear our God say unto us, Well done, well done, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Come on up, and I'll make you ruler over many. If there's one here today that hasn't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your faith has been a head knowledge, but now you want to move to that faith knowledge, that heart knowledge where you can trust and believe even when you can't see. That you're going to feel, that you're going to know 
that God has sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to take your place on a rugged cross, to die and suffer for the sins of the whole world. He suffered, bled, and died in your place, in my place. And if you would confess with your mouth, verbalize it, and believe what's coming out of your mouth is coming from your heart, that you are truly sorrowful for the sins that you have done, and you're asking God to forgive you. You're asking God to allow Jesus to be the substitution for your sins. You accept him. The Bible says at this point you are saved that you are rescued, that you are redeemed, you are brought back to God. And now you can live a holy life, that you can strive to be Christ-like in your walk, in your talk, in the way you love one another. And if by chance you need a day-to-day -day lesson, just open up the New Testament and begin to read the Gospels and you will see love in action. Jesus. Jesus. Closing the gap between faith and works. All you have to do is confess him. If you confess him, you are saved today. If you're viewing us by live stream, just send us a message on the message board saying, I have received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, contact information. We will get back in contact with you, pray for you and with you. If you're in the area, we'd love for you to come and join us here at 175 Second Avenue each Sunday morning. If not, we'll be able to help you and direct you to a church where you can receive the word of God, where you can grow in your faith and your walk with the Lord. To all of our members here present and those who are watching us, we bid you God's blessings. We bid you God's peace. We bid you God's strength. And we encourage you to be in study, be in prayer, be in meditation. The word is not just to the preacher, but it's to the believers. Study to show yourself approved a workman that needed not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Come on, let's give God a hand clap of praise in the sanctuary. I pray today that this word has been a blessing unto you, that it has challenged your walk with the Lord, that it would make you take a whole different look with what you believe and what you demonstrate in the life that you live for the Lord. I thank you for coming out. I thank you for being a part of this worship. I thank you for your prayers, your gifts, and your words of encouragement to me and my family. As you are praying and lifting me up, just know each and every day I'm doing the same for you because I love you with the biggest heart that I have, and that is the love of God. Hallelujah. As we prepare to go down from this place, we remind you at the conclusion of this service, we will be receiving our tithes and our general offerings. We ask that our deacons will come forth with the tables. Section A will bring theirs. Same time as Section C. Section B, you would bring yours uh, at the end of that. Here at First Baptist Church of Bayshore, we take our tithes and offerings. We put them in our right hand. And we say we put them in our right hand because we want to give God what's and not what's. For when we give God what, he will truly bless what's left. God, we thank you and we bless you. We praise you for the privilege that is ours to come into this, your house, and hear an inspiring song and an encouraging and uplifting and empowering word. And now as we prepare to leave this place, we leave the remnants of our blessing. We leave, Lord God, what you've asked us to leave. We leave our tithes and our offerings in this place. That ministry may continue, that we may continue to be a blessing to the world and to the body of Christ. We ask, Lord God, that you dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. We ask, God, that you remember that we will remember all of the announcement that we have been shared with us. And if we're able, we will govern ourselves accordingly. We ask these in all blessings. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before his divine majesty with exceeding great joy, be power, dominion, and peace from henceforth and forevermore. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. Section A and C. The church say amen. God has spoken. So let the say amen. Let the church. Say amen. Thank you.
you, sir. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. Let the church say amen.